recorded February 23rd, 2011. You're listening to the Wild Poor Dog podcast with Karen Wilde and John Buskell. Good morning, Karen. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm fine. How are you? Oh, I'm all right. Ready to ready to bark and roll. Not rock and roll, <laughs> bark and roll. <laughs> bark and roll. We've had a bark sent in, haven't we? Yeah, we have. We've got a bark uh, and it's Mina barking. Mina, Mina. Okay. Beautiful dog. L- listen, listen to this one then. <coughs> wow, how about that for a bark, Karen? I love the rah 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 at the end. That's absolutely brilliant. I think um, I love it when I I think um, you know, my dog's trying to bark on command because she, you know, she almost certainly is because you can hear it bark and then wait and then bark and then wait. And I I kind of like that because it it reminds me of my old dog Pepper, who who I did I didn't do particularly well in, but we did do working trials training, and you have to teach him to speak on command. And he used to start off kind of looking at me very questioningly for a long time, and then do an experimental bark, which used to kind of go. Oof, like that <laughs> and it was just the funniest thing and i wish i'd got it recorded now i'm sure i have somewhere but uh, sadly passed away now but you know it's, it's i love it so please send us more barks we love those and uh, who's who sent mina barking oh, this is from susan who i actually i actually do know i didn't know that her dogs could do this though and i was absolutely chuffed to get she sent us quite a few and i picked this one out because i just thought it was it was really lovely because it was it was clearly a dog going I'm barking because you want me to bark, as opposed to there's someone at the door or go away or, you know, 101 other reasons why a dog might bark. So I I absolutely love that. So, guys, if you're listening to the different tones of barking your dog, try and sort out what they're trying to say, because they do react and interact in different ways through their through their vocalization. So, you know, nice one. Okay, well, coming up on the show today, the main segment, we're going to be talking about dogs that pull. But before we get to that, um, we've got a reader question, uh, and that comes in from Martin on Twitter. And Martin asks, why would a dog never settle and always get up when you do and crave attention? And this has happened with the guide dog that he's been looking after. Yeah, it's it's interesting. It's, it's, it's Sometimes it's very hard to say without seeing, um, but I do think that you, you find... Some dogs, especially dogs that are bred to work with people or are trained to work with people, they are extremely responsive to your reactions. It it gives you the impression that they kind of never leave you alone and you've got this thing that's, you know, putting you under surveillance at all times and these pairs of eyes that follow you around. And the craving attention thing, I think, is is interesting because it, it, it says to me that the dog is finding something to do with what you're doing rewarding it might just be that they're naturally rewarded by attention it might be that they're trying to tell you something Mm. um but to have that level of communication with some dogs um is 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 quite a nice thing sometimes it can be a bit of a nuisance like i say you feel like you can't even go to the loo without you know the dogs following you everywhere but it's usually because they're anticipating something that you are about to do so um i would say that you know if you if you have that kind of thing particularly if you have more than one dog um try and look at it in the sense of am I going to reward this now because do I like it do I want them to do this or is the dog actually trying to read what I'm doing Mm. waiting for something that's coming um I I mean I have to admit my own dogs do it all the time Mm. you know I sometimes I one of them in particular will follow me absolutely everywhere but she's fine when I'm not there she's she copes well with being left you know sometimes it can be a separation issue that the dog is anxious and, and doesn't want you to go out of their sight mm. um but in but it, you know in which case you need to sort of read up on that a little bit and perhaps refer back to our podcast where we talked about dearborn i think it was the one where we talked about barking yeah um i think when you look back though um at what your dog is doing and when they're doing it it might be that you always go to the kitchen and get something out of the fridge at certain times of the night you know (laughs) do you know what i mean it's like snack hunting or it might be that you always do something with them when you get to a certain point or as soon as they jump up and look at you you maybe have a chat to them i quite often do that and say well you can stay there you know and the dog's going you're talking to me whereas before i've just been watching tv and doing not very much so i would i would just have a have a little look at it do a bit of exploring and see what see what it is they're getting out of it and maybe think about your own behavior that maybe when you're getting up martin maybe you're looking to the dog because you expect this you know maybe you are actually giving a cue that the dog is reading yeah absolutely and i think we can give lots and lots of body cues we've talked about this with handling haven't we in the last podcast and the one before Mm. your body signals are so significant to the dog you don't have to actually open your mouth to communicate with the dog 
we, we know that dogs are fabulous at reading body language with each other and with us. And, you know, particularly if they've been brought up like a guide dog would be to interpret people's body signals and not just rely on, on, on sound commands. So, yeah, and, and I just think that's fantastic. And that's why I think dogs make such fantastic parts of the family. They make great companions because they're, they're kind of with you, you know. They, they might not always do what you want, but they're, they're with you all the time. You know, they're kind of looking at you and checking that what are you doing and reading cues like you say. Um, and maybe there's something in it for them. I just I just find it fascinating. So thank you, Martin, for that. Great yeah. question. Yeah, thanks very much, Martin. And if you've got a question that you'd like to ask us, um, get in touch on Twitter and you can send a message to twitter.com slash wildpaw, and that's Karen's Twitter handle, or you can send an email to podcast at intellidogs.co.uk. That was the right address, wasn't it, Karen? That's right, absolutely. <laughs> I, had, I had a moment's madness there. Okay, let's <laughs> let's let's move on. Um, you've got some news about what's happening in the UK with uh, with dogs at the moment. Yeah, I found a little story. Um, it's really nice. There's a group called the um, the Canine Project, and what it is, it's a complimentary education program for young people, um, many of whom, you know, they lack confidence or they've got special needs and they work with animals, um, and in this case, dogs, to, to develop, uh, you know, positive life skills. And they can work individually or they can work in small groups. And there's a group of them that have released um, released a record and um, they're called the Canine Crew. Um, their, ma- their motivation to do it is to raise money for charity. Um, the Canine Partners is, is one of the charities that... Um, that's involved here and you know they're trying to um you know they've made a recording they're going to sell records they're trying to raise money for charity but they're working with animals as well as a way of building their own confidence and that kind of thing i don't know that much about the group but i do love the whole idea behind it and i was contacted this week by somebody who who works in a school in scotland and they take their dog into the school and that you know that the dog is used as a way of building the children's confidence and and it harks back to my work with Coco the school dog um, at the special school near me I absolutely love projects that are to do with children to do with dogs that build their confidence that give them something to interact with that's kind of no pressure that's great so I just thought I'd bring that one up and if anyone's got any projects like that going on please let us know about them because we will publicize your project for you if it's that kind of ethos behind it that's the kind of thing that I love to promote so do let me know absolutely what a really fabulous initiative all right Cameron just let me do this so it's time for the main segment of the show and we're talking about Dogs that pull. Oh boy, did I have that this morning. Three <laughs> five and a half month old pups trying to fix them in in a, a quick zip round the, the 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 block here. Oh, it's not really a block. It's it's too, there's too many trees. Uh, in minus twenty, three pups. One of them, Dearborn. Oh, I want to I want to pull ahead. Want to pull ahead. And what I was doing was every time some one of the dogs pulled, I turned around and started walking in the other direction, trying to keep the lead loose. Was I doing the right thing, Karen? Oh, it's a big, that's a biggie. Uh, Yes and no. Yes, probably. No, I don't know because I haven't seen it. Um, Yeah, I always have this, I can see you laughing. I have this kind of get out because we talked about body signals, didn't we? And unless I can see exactly what the dog is doing myself and see what you're doing, it's really hard to tell you if you're doing the right thing because it might be that you're doing the right thing and your timing's off. It might be that the dog is doing something else. It might be that the dog is anxious and therefore moving away from the thing is actually feeding the, the habit. So I think that's really raised the first and most important point. Why? You know, why is the dog pulling on, on its lead? Why do so many dogs do that? And and really, it's the first thing that most, most people, if they ring me as a trainer or if they ring me with a behavior problem, they almost always say, oh, and the dog really pulls on the lead and I don't know what to do. And I've tried 101 different gadgets and it still does it and it's driving me crackers. I can't, you know, it can get people to the point where they won't take the dog out. It can get people to the point where the dog is absolutely terrible with other dogs because the tension that's built up between the lead and the handler is is so bad that they they just can't you know they can't exist with this dog because it just can't go out and then that compounds the problem because the dog isn't getting enough exercise and then you have a really really hyper dog when you finally do go out so it's such a fundamental thing that we need to sort out and do you know something i have to say and i have to remind myself as well dogs are not born with a collar and a lead on 
They do not know what it is. They can't see it. They can only feel it. Mm. They don't know what that is for. They've got absolutely no concept of that from, from, from puppyhood or if you haven't put them on a lead for a long time or if you get a rescue. They don't know what that is. So, so let's look at that first of all. Um, this is where I start kind of banging the table a bit. So I can see, me. Karen. Excuse I can see. Ranting. Is that steam? I'm emoting. <laughs> steam coming out of your headphones. Well, okay. it's, it seems really obvious, but it's not obvious. You know, we are so used to the the, the images of dogs as pets, and they, they've got a collar, they've got a lead. That's what a dog is. But a dog doesn't know that. You know, nobody's actually explained to the dog, oh, yeah, you're, by the way, you know, when we take you out, you can't just run around. Um, you know, there are cars, there are dangers, there's a law here. You know, so, of course, what the dog immediately does is see something, especially if they're a young puppy, and they just want to get to it. Mm. It might be that they want to get away from it, of course, but they want to move around independently. And then all of a sudden, there's this thing stopping them. Mm. And that thing happens to be attached to a person. They may or may not make that connection. And in my opinion, they don't make the connection. They just feel this thing around their neck so if you've got a young puppy you do i do get a lot of calls saying you know they won't they can't stand their lead they don't know what you know they lay down or they or they sort of shake and shiver oftentimes it's just because they are so inhibited by what's going on you know what, what's this around my neck and i need to go over here and i can't and now i feel trapped and i'm going to lie there and and you know so they can't express themselves naturally mm. so it's really important, first of all, that we try and get the dog not necessarily working on what the lead is doing. Mm. Because, you know, with a young puppy, you can pop the lead on, let them trail it around the house or give it, put it on while they're doing something else um, and just let them get used to the feel of it. But it's a big handling exercise to try and teach yourself to only use the lead when you have to mm. and the rest of the time to teach the dog to follow what you're doing and where you are and what your feet are doing and what the, what you're saying to them and that is how I get my biggest success with dogs so if you ask me a question like well I sort of they pull and I sort of turn around in some ways you can see the dog is learning that as soon as there's a tension feeling on their neck they end up going in the opposite direction away from what it is they want to get to that's kind of a point but it's better that they learn from scratch what i teach is walk with me and that sounds really easy doesn't it walk with me so when i'm walking you can walk and when i'm not walking you have to wait and unless I've told you to stand still and wait or sit or whatever, we've also taught the dog as, a, as an adjunct, you know, um, then if I'm moving, the dog moves with me. And if I'm not moving, the dog doesn't move. And that's pretty much the rule. So that sounds simple enough, doesn't it, John? Yeah. Walk with me. How do you, how do you teach walk with me? Well, first of all, if you've got a dog that already pulls, that is, that is the crucial part. If you've got a big, strong dog that is pulling you around and you can't get any communication going with it because you're frightened that the dog's going to pull you over you have to get the right equipment first of all um i can get very technical about this i won't um there are lots of very poor harnesses you can use and very poor head collars you can use and there are a lot of very good ones it's not really my place to endorse any product that i you know that i think but what i normally use is a harness that fits comfortably on the dog and attaches to a front ring on the dog's chest nothing on the dog's back the reason I don't put something on the dog's back is because effectively you end up with a husky that will that will haul you around and put the whole weight of their body into a sort of multi-point harness and drag you even harder. So first of all, a good harness with a front ring attachment. I don't use choke chains. I haven't used those for about, oh gosh, 15 years. They were used when I started and I'm embarrassed to say I do know how to use them, but I don't use them because they work on a pain principle and there's all sorts of damage you can cause to the dog and mm. yourself by using them. So, you know, I'm not going to waste time going on about those. Mm. I don't use them. I think they're a poor, poor handling method. Very poor, mm. very poor communication. Um, so decent harness or a head collar or in some cases I will use both with a double ended lead so that a strong dog simply cannot drag me over that is the first and most important point so you don't have to use those if you've got an ordinary flat collar on the dog the method works just as well but if you've got a strong dog you need to get that sorted out first then keep it simple so walk with me so let's look at why is the dog pulling the dog wants to get to well what what's uh, what's the most obvious thing what's the most obvious thing the dog wants to get to something wants to get to another dog yeah. So it can see something. So yeah. it might be another dog. It might be, um, you know, a thing it can see blowing about in the wind. Approaching what car. Is, 
approaching car or trying to pull away from and, and or pull away from all those other things as well that we've just mentioned. Or, and there is one big thing that we always forget as human beings, dogs have an exceptional sense of smell. So oh, you yeah. take you take them out and they might be great around the house. You've done your little heel work exercise that you learned in puppy class. All that's really, really great. But you go outside and there are smells wafting all over the place that we cannot see. We can't see. So your dog is there with all this stuff coming into its head. You know, it can hear things as well. It can feel things on its skin if it's windy, you know, all these things. So the dog's reward is to get to those things isn't it Do you, oh, usually yeah. as long as you don't have an anxiety problem in which case you'd need to see someone like me to get that get help with that so the walk itself is the biggest and best reward for the dog so what you have to set up is a way of teaching the dog that if they walk with you they will get to these things a lot faster you know if they are staying with you they will get to the smell the lamppost the other dog the mm. this the that with you if you're not there they won't get there Okay. Okay. So, so that sounds really easy, doesn't it? Thinking in the dog's mind. Okay. Now, how do I know that I'm with the person? This is where a lot of handlers go wrong. They hold the lead really tight, and the dog is kind of half, kind of strangled and restrained on this lead. There's a lot of tension, and the dog kind of thinks, right, well, I'm going to pull out of sheer frustration to get to this thing. They don't have a facility for getting there without that lead tension. So as soon as you hold the lead tight, the dog immediately starts to pull because it's like an, it's an opposite reaction to the pull. They'll lean against it. And then you both end up going towards this thing with a tight lead. So you've got to then get the dog to follow something else, not the lead. Mm -hmm. And what's the, what's the easiest thing that a dog can see? Any size dog, but, you know, any size dog, what can they see straight away without having the lead around their neck? The ground. Put you on the spot here. The, the ground, ground, yeah. So they can see the ground. What else? They can see straight ahead if they're looking straight ahead. Okay, but what about the great big lamppost-shaped being next to them? Oh, yeah, the human being walking them. Yeah, so they can see your feet and your legs, yeah. and they can see when they move, and they can see when they stop. Mm -hmm. And that's very easy for a dog to do that, no matter how big or small the dog. You know, it's all right holding a treat in your hand and walking along and saying heel. That's, that's kind of a different thing, if you like. It, it is and it isn't, but you try and do that with a small dog, it's quite hard. If you've got a dog that already pulls, they probably don't want the food or the toy that's in your hand anyway. No. So it's, it's not a lot of use trying to do that. Yes, you can build it up gradually and it takes a lot of time, but the quick route, okay, follow my feet. Here are my feet, my feet are still. So unless you're actually standing still with me, we're not going anywhere. And then when my feet start to move, you can move as long as the lead's not tight. If the lead goes tight, you reposition the dog back to where you want them to be, which is right next to your feet. And it doesn't matter which side of the dog. I generally pick the side away from the traffic. That's when just, you say you know, re reposition them, Karen, do you call them into you um, uh, so they sit or you just wait for them to come back to the position? Or You can, you can wait for them to come back. You can just stand there patiently mm -hmm. if you start making lots of noises and vocalization what you're then doing is reinforcing the wrong position because mm -hmm. you're kind of marking the wrong position so what i do especially if i've got a big dog as well i keep my hands very close to my body so my arms aren't doing the movement because the dog can't see that either because it's right above their head i call it pudding stirring mm -hmm. because people's arms go round around the dog's head yeah. and the dog can't see a thing hold the lead right close to your body and tuck your elbows in particularly if you've got a big dog and start to move back a few paces you don't have to turn around mm. you can if you're unsteady on your feet but it's better if you just shift back a little bit because again your feet are moving away so the dog starts to see where are you going mm. and and then the lead will follow up with that so if the dog doesn't follow your feet the lead will do the rest you know the lead will steer them back i normally circle the dog round quite simply by moving back moving the lead a little bit so the dog can turn so they've got space to turn away and then the dog ends up back at my feet again i will have to show you this on video because it's, it's not that difficult but a lot of people get themselves really hung up about it mm. the point is you're moving your feet so it's your feet that are doing the signaling mm. not your voice not your hands because all of those things the dog doesn't they, they, it, it takes a while for them to connect to doing all of that steer the dog back start again make sure the lead is loose before you set off and try again and you will find that before very long you start doing these little shuttle runs up the street and you're at the end of the street mm. and then you're at the end of the next street and then you're at the end of the next street and each part even if it's only three paces one pace ten paces that's it have been done with a loose lead and you suddenly find these dogs kind of looking sideways at your leg and they realize what they're looking at now so a lot it, now a lot of owners have two dogs 
you know, yeah. I think it's quite common to have two dogs because people yeah. like to have a friend for their, 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 their you know, one dog. Um, and one dog may pull more than the other. Should you be training this individually or should you be training it with both of them? Um, definitely to start with, you need to do one at a time because what you're trying to get the dog to learn is what, what are my feet doing? You know, what are my feet doing? And if the dog's looking at your feet and the other dog and then there's a bit of competition going on, which there, yeah, there usually is, you know, one dog will smell something and then all the other dogs will want it. They're not concentrating hard enough. So I take one dog out and I teach them and then I go straight back in the house and I fetch the next dog and I train that and then I go straight back in the house again and I fetch both dogs out. And that's how I do it. And I do it in a very, very intensive burst because while you're doing all this shuttle running and trying to get the dog to concentrate, they are getting exercise and they are getting stimulation. So they'll get tired just as quickly as on a normal walk. So you're working on the principle that this dog has to concentrate. Now it's concentrating and it knows pretty much what I'm going to do. We bring in the next dog, swap them over, get that dog to concentrate and you'll find they'll be different. Then you put the dogs together and that's when they both have to concentrate. And you just take it back to square one every time. Remember, John, you know, this is training. Yeah. It's training. So it takes time for the dogs to learn. It takes time for, for us to learn, doesn't it? Mm. I mean, you know, we don't get it straight away. So no. we're learning, the dog's learning, and then the dog's learning and the other dog's there. And I'd say to people, you know, make it part of your normal walking time. You don't need to worry too much about doing it all the time, but do start your walk with it because yeah. then, you're winning. You know, if you start even just before you get out of the door, don't let the dog haul you straight out the door. That's a really bad time to start. You know, start before the door. Teach the dog. We're both going out of the door. I mean, both I think that's a really, really good point to make. Um, you know, this kind of before the walk even starts that the dog should be calm, that the dog should be waiting for you. You know, when you signal, because I mean, people will pick up the lead and then the dog goes berserk. Hey, we're going for a walk. Hey, we're going for a walk. Because you need to, when that moment that you go over the threshold, that the dog is with you and concentrating and is not yeah. in that kind of state of hyper excitement. Yeah, it's absolute, and it's such an important safety aspect. You know, I mean, I've, I've talked about this before. I never, ever let dogs shove, them, shove their way through the front door. It's got absolutely nothing to do with that old age dominance rubbish stuff that's talked about. It's nothing to do with that at all. It is more to do with if you let the dog get out the door before you, that they can see the cats, the cars, the smells are there. Everything is there. You have no control over that at all. On the flip side, when I come in the house, I put the dog in first. And mm. the reason I do that is because I'm not leaving my dog back out on the street while I'm in the house. Mm. It's, you know, they don't do it with guide dogs. They don't do it with any assistance dogs. You know, they don't leave the dog out the back. You know, they put the dog through where they can keep an eye on it. And that's just, that's just common sense, isn't it? I wouldn't let my children do that either because... You know, no matter where you live, you don't know what's right outside your front door. No, exactly. And you don't know on that. If you let your dog out in a high state of excitement, they might well chase it and that would be it. So, mm. you know, or you get yanked through the door. So I don't do that. And I think door safety is very, very important as well. You know, not allowing the dog to dash at the door stops guarding. It stops, um, you know, chasing behaviours. It teaches the dog to be steady. It stops them running out and running past the car and out into the street when you're just going to the shop lots and lots of reasons why you should deal with that so again walk with me if the handler is there walking with the dog the dog can keep an eye on you you can keep an eye on them you can deal with any problems before they actually arise so back to the dog radar thing we talked about sure. last week sure um there's lots and lots of little handling tips to do with lead pulling as well so once you've got once you've got out there and you're working on this and you're thinking yeah my dog's actually starting to follow my feet you know and you can do it very quickly then I start to like play with it I start to test them so I'll sort of walk really really slowly and then I'll speed up and then I might back away and then I might turn around and I might do little things to make sure the dog's really looking at me going where's she going now what, what where's she going and all of the time that they do it right as soon as I see that little bit of eye contact or that slowing down response I praise the dog like really big time now when you say praise I mean, I have an, one of the things that I observe here at the moment, there's quite a few people with, with young, young dogs around the, the neighborhood. Um, and they're always fiddling with treats. You know, there mm -hmm. they are walking with the dog and, you know, they're stopping and starting and, and then they're trying to reward the dog with a, a snack or a, you know, how do you feel about treats in the, the, the teaching of walking of, of, of good lead behavior? I, I do use I, I do divide up the two things in a way. I teach not pulling, which is what we've just talked about now. Not pulling before you can get anywhere else, you've got to stop the dog hauling you around and you've got to stop hauling the dog around. 
that's that's kind of absolutely fundamental training if you then want to teach a heel position then that is uh, i can teach that in the home with a treat and hold my hand or drop it on the floor however you decide to do it to position the dog at your side um usually it's easier for the dog if you start one side and then the other but if you're teaching a command i tend to use heel on one side and this side on the other because that's just what i'm used to doing and that doesn't necessarily stop the dog pulling. I think this is what we're trying to get rid of, is get rid of that setup that when you're out, the dog hauls you around. And when the dog doesn't want to hear heel and doesn't want to have your treat, this is how you deal with it. On the other side of things, then, if you've got a dog that is, um, you know, fairly well responsive to treats, because they're not all responsive to treats, and you've got a high value treat, and you can do this all around the house and garden with the treat in your hand and the dog's looking up at you going, yes, that's great. You can then integrate that into your walk so you might find a time where the dog's away from you and you can see something in the distance because you've got your doggy radar switched on and you think right I need the dog to come back but I don't want them to come back and sit in front of me I actually want them to come back and just walk at my side so you may not want to put the lead on at that point anyway so you say heel and the dog should if you've trained it properly come back position itself at your side you can then put the lead on or not but they should maintain that position and that is what I use the treat training part of this for um, you can use toys, you can use other things and, and with a dog that's not bothered about treats oh I can hear them, are you agreeing in the background? Yes, yeah, they've <laughs> just woken up <laughs> um, If you're positioning them at your side then you have to motivate them to do it and again if you know that your dog is not motivated by treats you can use the lead to position them you can still reward them with your voice but partly and this is the biggest, biggest part I guess the reward is not food it's not like an external thing that you're producing, it is if you stand here and walk next to me, we will get to that thing that you want to get to. We will continue to move. We will carry on your walk. Mm. So, as I say, all this is assuming that the dog is relaxed and comfortable with what's going on. If you have an anxious dog, it may work in a slightly different way. And that's really more of a sit down and talk to you about it job, you know, because anxiety in a dog is, is quite a complex issue. But, yes, I do use food sometimes. I use it to teach specific things. And it can be very useful as an adjunct to what we're trying to get now. But if you're trying to hold the lead tight and stop the dog pulling and use food and there's another dog there and you are destined to fail, mm. you really are, unless you've got a dog that is obsessed with food. And some owners are very lucky that they've got a dog that's so obsessed with food, they, they get the bit of cheese out and the dog's glued. Great. Use it. Don't feel embarrassed about it. Go for it. That's fantastic. If you can do it, great. But the flip side of that is if you've got a dog that's very high very highly uh, motivated by that kind of thing they're also the kind of dog that will go off hunting for bits of rubbish and everything else they can yeah. eat so again you go back to square one of this podcast and you start again now we talked you mentioned collars karen um mm. what about leads i mean I, I this morning in fact i saw someone out with a very young uh, uh cavalier king charles spaniel and um they were trying to lead train with a flexi lead mm -hmm. and i'm thinking no it's um i do you know, I do tend to look at the person rather than the equipment. I, I can, like I say, I can get very technical about equipment. Um, <laughs> I can hear them in the background. Um, the, you know, I generally use a bog standard four foot lead. Uh, we've talked about this, haven't we? And I use a bridal leather lead because I just think they're yeah. so comfortable and they last forever. Brilliant, brilliant things. Don't care that it's expensive at the start. It lasts for like 20 years. You know, that's it. But I don't really have anything against flexi leads per se. You know, if it's it's what you're doing with it that really matters, you know, so if you've got the lead and you're holding it in the right way and it's the right sort of length, that's fine. But you would have to lock off the flexi lead. You can't have it trailing if you're going to do this method because, you know, the dog will just keep going and keep going until they get to the end of the flexi lead and, and they haven't really learned anything from you. So you would still have to hold the lead close in. Mm. Um, but they are difficult because you kind of got this chunk of plastic in your hand and that's quite difficult to manoeuvre sometimes. Um I know a lot of trainers that absolutely hate the retractable leads. They hate them. I think if that's what the owner's got and that's my job to be with them, then I can show them with whatever lead is appropriate to the size of their dog, as long as it's safe, you know, not a little thin thing with a great big dog, that's dangerous. Um, then, then I will use that because it's the technique that really matters. Mm -hmm. Okay, as, we're, as time is, is, is moving on, um, I think that, you know, just to, to sort of concept check a few things before we, we leave this topic, and I'm sure this is something we'll return to again and again. So what you're saying is walk your dog in a quiet area at first, make sure that you're, you know, one dog, one trainer, 
you know, that you haven't got family and friends, you know, hanging around, that you haven't got other dogs hanging around, and that you start off training in a, in a safe environment, say in the home, that you're working with the lead initially, and then you move out to the, the outside area, that you shouldn't think of a, a, a walk. I mean, there is this kind of pressure that, you know, you've got your dog, out you go, and you walk in a straight line, that it's, you know, it's actually okay to, you know, keep the training to a shorter area and build it up and then if you really feel that the dog is you know that you're not getting anywhere that it's not working out that if the dog is still really really pulling and barking and lunging then perhaps it's time to seek you know some 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 qualified help from a trainer yeah absolutely I mean if the dog's barking and lunging then it says to me that the dog is well over threshold and and that's not good because that means that once that dog is in that kind of state you're not really going to win because you're you're then battling with a load of adrenaline and everything else that's going on in the dog's mind so it's not a good idea but definitely um it's 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 a case of you're getting the dog to concentrate on you to concentrate on your movement and earn the functional reward that is going towards something so if you know i'm not saying um because i do get asked this as well once i've got to this point they say well can't i let the dog just have a few sniffs absolutely yeah that's the whole point of the walk as long as you can go with the dog make sure the dog is not dragging you towards these things. If they start to drag you towards the nearest corner where every other dog is peed, you know, don't let them do that because that is a big reward right in front of you that you can then use. You can use it. So do what I've said. Keep the lead close to your body. Take a few paces back until the dog's by your side. Wait until the lead is loose. And if, and if you have to wait and reposition and wait and reposition, that's fine be calm about it but then you can both go over to that sniff while the lead is loose so the dog then twigs right okay so when your feet move human we can both go so I get there anyway all I have to do is control my impulse a little bit and and kind of keep looking at you and indicate maybe that I want to go over there and you may let me go over there as long as I'm with you but the bottom line is if they don't let you and as soon as that lead goes tight no we're not going there we're not going over there now, I know, Karen, that, and we've said before, um, if you're interested in, in, in putting together your own tailor-made um, training manual, you can get that from Karen's website. And I know that, Karen, is, you've got a fabulous handout because I've looked through it myself and thought, <laughs> oh, even though I did a, a year's tr- clicker training, um, you know, I'm a qualified instructor over here in Sweden. I've read this and thought, oh, my God, I have to try that. Oh, my God. So what's the name of that that the, that handout that people can buy and, and um, where can they get it? Well, it's a brand new one. Uh, there is one on my site at the moment, but that's the that's the old style. I'm uploading this one um, today. It's a new style handout. It's just easier to to plan what you're going to do. Um, the handout title is Walking on Lead. But when you look on the website, it is Stop Your Dog Pulling on the Lead because that is really what we want, isn't it? We want to stop the dog doing that. And here's the thing, John. The thing I really, really like about this method, not, not you know, wonderful method I've developed type, big-headed thing. Not That's not what I mean. What I mean is I am so fed up with horrible, harsh handling for this problem, yanking the dog, punishing it, yelling at it, putting nasty things around its neck, you know, zapping it with a collar. It's just so unnecessary. You do not need to do that. And if you've got a choice, if someone gave you a choice with one hand, you could do the horrible way. You could do the way that relies on pain with a choke chain or a half choke you could do all of that and make yourself miserable and the dog miserable and probably injure the dog in the process and there is veterinary evidence to show that it does injure the dog it can cause their eyes to pop forwards it can cause neck and and throat problems it can cause back problems let alone the problems it causes with the owners with shoulder back wrist elbow problems all of those things you you've got that in one hand or you can choose a method that is calm quiet determined self-rewarding long term doesn't hurt you've got strength equipment so that you know again you can misuse halties you can misuse head head collars and harnesses you can misuse them but you don't need to do that with this you're literally using them to help you steer a dog that is physically stronger than you that's fine you know keep your hands low so you're not lifting the dog then you're not going to damage your back you're not going to damage your elbows and you're certainly not going to damage the dog You know, if you're going to do some physical training with a dog, I always recommend that you make sure the dog's okay. You know, don't start turning the dog around and doing all this if your dog's got hip problems, for example. But it's much, much safer, much more ethical. And, you know, you're a team, aren't you? I keep going on about this, but you are. You're a team with your dog. And that's why you're there. You've got your dog as a lovely companion in your house. They might be a pain sometimes, 
but they're still your dog. And let's work together. Why not? Walk with me. That's what you really want to do. Oh, Karen, I love it when you get so passionate about I, this. Thing. It's just my thing. I can't help it. I just I, I see it every single day. And I love sorting things out like this because it, you can see results in 10 minutes. It's not a magical cure. It just makes sense to the dog. That's all it does. Okay. So what have we got coming up next week, Karen? Oh, well, next week I've been invited to, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's next week, she says, looking around for her diary. Um, I'm going to a book launch at the Kennel Club. Um, Mark the Vet, who, who's on um, one of our television shows over here, who does, um, well, he's on, he's on a couple, but he's, he's actually released a book about his early years as a vet. And, um, and he's, he's launching that book now. So, that, so that's going to be something I'll, te- I'll tell you all about that and hopefully have an interview with him. And um, he's promised us an anecdote that her, about dogs, which is, I'm quite looking forward to. I've also got a challenge that I'm going to unveil next week, which I really want our, our regular listeners and, and new listeners to the podcast to sort of help us along with, called Skinny Paws. Um, it's to do with, um, we're raising money for medical detection dogs who are the ones that detect cancer or they can detect Brilliant. when someone's about to have an epileptic fit or, and we're raising money for that through a sponsored slim. We've got a website, myself and Lynn, who is from dougalsden.co.uk. Um, and we've, we want you to set us challenges so that either a forfeit, if we don't lose a little bit of weight, neither of us have got tons to lose, be fair, but we do want to get back into some nice clothes that we own. And um, so we really want your support on that. And we want some challenges that are, you know, excruciatingly embarrassing so that we don't want to do them and, and are motivated. And some nice challenges as well so that, you know, if, 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 if we can get people to li- listen in or look in on the podcast, uh, look in on Twitter to see how we're getting on. Those are the kind of things we want to do. So I will tell you more about that next week. OK, fabulous. Well, I'd just like to say if you're a regular listener to the show, thanks very much for listening. And uh, if you're a new listener, thanks very much for joining the community. Um, if you'd like to contact us and get in touch and ask questions or observations or send us a bark, uh, how can people get in touch, Karen? You can, well, you can contact me on Twitter. My um, Twitter ID is wildpaw, W-I-L-D-P-A-W, or send me an email, um, which comes to podcast at karenwild.co.uk. Or you can go onto my website, which is intellidogs.co.uk, and send me a contact through that. So there's loads of ways to get in touch. Please get in touch. We love hearing from you. We've got, we've got some great listeners out there. So thank you, everybody. And it's really nice to hear your views. And if you'd like to put together your own tailor-made training course, go to Karen's website that she just mentioned, intellidogs.co.uk, and put together your own training manual at a very, very good price. Well, yeah, and also if you've got any questions on specifics, do let me know. You know, again, I'm, I'm often on Twitter. So if you want to, you know, if you've got one of the manuals and you're not quite sure on one bit, let me know and I will get back to you because feedback is very important. It helps me do things better as well. Absolutely. And although we give lots of free advice and lots of, you know, engaging conversation about dogs, remember we are doing this out of the out of our love for dogs. So any support that you can give us, uh, and that's really much, really appreciated, isn't it, Karen? Yeah, it makes it possible. That's that's what I like about it. It is a community. I think that's a really good word. And I love I love the fact that some of my some of our listeners and, and some of my clients as well like you know they chat to each other on twitter and compare notes and it's great i i love that side of things you know we are companion companionable people we love our dogs we like to mix i think that's great it's nice to be sociable all right karen well i'm off to do some lead training with three puppies <laughs> thanks very much karen bye now thank you see you bye <laughs>